Joe Bennett and Nelson for your show. Hello, Grizzy. How are you? Very good. Good. The, um, an evening with Joe Bennett. Mm. That'll be a great evening, I'd imagine. Well, I've had 55 years of them. They're not all wonderful, but um, <laughs> yes. Uh, Oh, I think it should be entertaining. I think there should be a laugh or two in there. Yeah. Um, that's the intention. Yeah. Now, you're going to be talking or discussing your new book? Or, or? Uh, if it crops up. Um, I mean, it's essentially a book promotion tour, but I'm happy that my business is to entertain and to provoke a bit of thought and discussion and, uh, and to go where it goes. So uh, if we happen to mention the book, we'll mention the book. But um, I'm hoping that the people who come along will have a good evening and come away satisfied. That's the purpose of the exercise. The publisher hopes that they will buy lots of books. But... Um, yeah. Uh, that's uh, not my primary intention. No. Yeah. So you're quite an entertaining columnist. You're, you're, would you say that you're designing, your, you're crafting your words to make people think? Or just to give them a good laugh? Um, I hope both. I mean, without wishing to sound too pompous, um, you aim to tell the truth and you aim to tell it in an entertaining way. And the truth, by definition, is often funny. I mean, the, the reason jokes work just ordinary jokes that you tell in the pub is that there is a nub of truth lurking in there and so the truth is often comic and um, so yeah I aim to be funnily true or truly funny that's the that's the purpose of um, of, of what I what I say I, I, yeah I try to tell the truth and I try to tell it in an entertaining way I mean there's no point in telling the truth if people if it's boring because um, then no one reads it. You know, they switch off after the first paragraph and go elsewhere in the newspaper. And so your job is to hold the reader, and you hold them by entertaining them and by telling them what is true. That's that's the aim. It's not always the achievement. Yeah. yeah. Fish like a drink. Yes. That's a really interesting title. Yeah. I mean, if you're trying to find a column, uh, a title for a bunch of short pieces that don't have anything necessarily in common, you can go anywhere. But that actually makes it quite hard to write titles. And. Um, so you play around with ideas, and, and I, I struck that one out so often on a dog walk, high on the hills, I thought, oh, yes, that'll do. And uh, <laughs> they liked it, so um, we went with it. Yeah. yeah. And last year's book, hmm. that's an interesting bit of subject material. Double happiness. Yeah. Have you read it? <laughs> no. Ah. <laughs> I'm afraid I haven't, but I'm really well, dying you to. Better, oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah, you've been dying I'm for dying a long to. time now. No, no, had, no, no. You have six months to deal yes, with it. Yes, yes. Well, I've only just discovered it exists, actually, right. Joe. I'm a bit, bit slow on right. the uptake. But, uh, it it's sounds, all about bullshit. Yeah. Mm. It sounds great. Of which there is an abundance in this world. And, uh, and that, that book's pr proved very popular. I've had a lot of correspondence from people, and it's nearly all been favourable. Um, and maybe those people who don't like it haven't bothered to say so. But um, it's been, it's basically trying to point out the methods by which um, people in power, all sorts of power, religious power, political power, social power, financial power, are trying to deceive you, to arouse you emotionally and to deceive you into um, maintaining them in positions of power. And it's, it's an, the, the business of bullshit. It's as old as the hills, it's as old as humankind. Yeah. And the methods by which it's done are, are remarkably few and remarkably simple, but they just persist and persist and persist. And the intention of the book is to, I hope entertainingly, point out how um, you are being, you are having bullshit fo foisted upon you uh, at all hours of the day. Right, so it's not a, not a book about how gullible we really are? In the end, <laughs> if you fall for something, it's your fault. Yeah. Um, and we all, in our, we all have a conflicting self that we, we know we're being deceived, let's say by a holiday brochure. We know when we get to the Maldives, say, it may look vaguely like those photographs, but somehow we won't turn into that perfect couple on the beach with the pina coladas and the, um, uh, and the deferential waiter and uh, being about to have sex under the palm trees. <laughs> we know somehow it won't happen because we are messy, frail and unsatisfactory human beings and somehow the ideal over there is not going to be um, recreated when we arrive because of our own messy, um, inconsequential selves. And, and yet, still a part of us yeah. yearns and falls for it. So we are, in the end, you're quite right, it is largely about our own gullibility. Mm -hmm. And all I'm trying to point out is the methods by which that gullibility is exploited. And, um, and it won't make a blind bit of difference, right. but it sort of gets it off your chest. Yeah. You know? <laughs>
So, you know, even while being deceived, it's, it's nice to know how it's being done, yeah. even while you fall for it. You know? yeah. Yeah. Now, you are a Cantabrian. Yeah, that's where I live. Yeah. Yes. How are you finding, this is changing the subject from... Go for it. How are you finding things in Christchurch since the time of the earthquake? Fine. Yep. Yeah, I mean, if you kick an ant's nest, all the ants go scurrying around madly for a while. Men, 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 in order to reassert the status quo. And you deal with certain priorities first. You deal with family and friends and those immediately around you first and then... You start looking to get your house repaired and, and, and so on. It's exactly the same and gradually reassert normality. Most people now, with some exceptions, but most people now have, have found a satisfactory way of living there. Mm. Some people have had to move out. Other people have had to get a new home or whatever. But, you know, virtually no one is using a port loo anymore. We, we've all got more or less satisfactory, with a few exceptions, more or less satisfactory situations. And if they're unsatisfactory, you continue to work to make them right. Yeah. But it's no longer a matter of life and death. And of course, in the long run, if we do it right, and that's a big if, we should come out with a spanking new city. I mean, how many cities get a chance to undo all their mistakes? That's right. You know, after the, the first earthquake in September, which did you know, reasonable damage, um, there was a, a series of seminars were planned, public ones, to discuss the rebuilding of Christchurch. And I was asked if I would MC these. And, and they were held in the art gallery in Christchurch. And um, we only held the first one because it was on, I think, the 19th of February before the big quake, not that we knew that. Yeah. And as MC, I had no expertise. My job was just to facilitate it. And I, I said at the beginning, I said, I, I've got no contribution to make except to say, right at the beginning, that if I'd been going to have an earthquake, I'd have had a much bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> because there were all sorts of things that I wanted to see knocked down, ugly, bloody things in the sense that hadn't come down. But, you know, comparatively, Christchurch was undamaged by the first one, really. Yeah. And, um, and then, of course, we, had, we never had any more seminars because <laughs> my wish had come true. Well, well, you know, did they just not ask you to host? <laughs> No, they were never held. They only had one. And, um, but the result is that, the, you know, the Red Zone, the centre of Christchurch, is virtually a blank page yeah. and there will be and have been and will continue to be huge arguments which is good about how it should be rebuilt but I think generally the blueprint that they've come up with is essentially a sound idea a framework within which I mean there will still be plenty of mistakes but with any luck we can design a city that suits the climate yeah. um, you know there's a sort of pesky easterly wind that takes the edge off Christchurch days which you, I don't think you get here so much and so you need to build courtyards. You need to build secluded areas. And of course, we can build a city that isn't dominated by the motor car. Yeah. You, know, that, you know, why do people like going to Venice? Why do they love walking around Venice? The buildings actually aren't spectacular. Um, most of them, there's a lot of you know, lovely paintings and so on, but the buildings are fairly ho-hum a lot. And what's lovely about it is there isn't a car inside. Yeah. And if you're walking you know, along Trafalgar Street, say here, you're always aware I mean, there's a lot of traffic calming devices and they go very slowly up Trafalgar Street. But you're always aware of this sort of one ton of vehicle that could run you over. In, you get into a little pedestrian precinct, such as in Christchurch around um, uh, uh, Sol Square that developed, um, that Dave Henderson developed. It was hugely popular because it was A, secluded from the wind, B, it was on a human scale. You know, well, why do people like little European villages with winding lanes and so on? Because it's on that human scale, and, and we can do that in Christchurch and, and organise the traffic so it goes along sort of certain main thoroughfares, but you can get away from that, and we, we can do all that now. And we've got the river and the park there, and so I, I think we should come up with a cracking city in the long run. And, um, but, you know, it's been pretty tough for a lot of people, and, and, and of course a lot of people died, but... Um, you move on. Ants nests rebuild themselves, and we're doing that. Yeah, and it's been fascinating psychologically watching people. I mean, uh, you know, if there had to be a big earthquake in New Zealand, I'm glad I was there rather than somewhere else. Yeah. It's quite tough being somewhere else, I think, because all you could feel was sort of remote sympathy and the inability to do much. I mean, the outpouring of generosity was magnificent because people felt a sort of, oh God, there, but for the grace of God, go I, and and a huge sums of money and offers of relief and and just generosity of spirit came out. And that would have happened, you know, let's say the event had happened in Wellington, that would have happened from Christchurch as well. But to be in the middle of it uh, and to see how people reacted and what happened and, you know, the 
the, the kindness and, and then the anger against the authorities and so on. I mean, you know, there was <laughs> some lovely sort of revolutionary stuff. It was mm. fascinating to watch. Well, that's interesting. It's sort of sort of unfolding in the courts with, with the insurance companies at the moment. Oh, yeah. I mean, the insurance companies are obviously going to be the whipping boy. Um, and some of them have behaved very well and some of them you feel have been a little bit dilatory. Mm. Um, but, you know, you're dealing with... Uh, insurance companies and money <laughs> but, and money but i mean a vast amount of money is going to come into christchurch from reinsurance that's foreign money it's going to be i don't know the exact figure but i believe about 30 billion dollars 30 billion dollars i don't know how that equates to gb gdp but that's a huge sum of money is going to come money that wasn't in the country before that is going to come from foreign reinsurers we have no reinsurers here who are rather regretting reinsuring New Zealand now, but they, they've got a contract and they will stand by it. And um, I, mean, I actually attended a conference of insurance agents not long ago, and there was a speaker from Munich Reinsurance, and he just showed the figures of what they are up for to pay for Christchurch, and I can't remember what it is. Then he showed the um, premiums that they had received from the whole of New Zealand, in the preceding year, and it would be 100 years without a claim before they were in the black. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, and, and they were going to stay in the market because that, and I really admire that because that was the, the ethically right thing to do, they said. Yeah. That it would make far more sense for them just to pay up this one, you know, take it on the chin and bugger off. But no, they are offering reinsurance still. In New Zealand. Obviously, premiums will rise. But that sum of money is going to come to Christchurch. It's like selling an extra 100 million lambs. Mm. That's going to come in and build a spanking new city. It's money we didn't have before. It was effectively tied up in buildings. Yes. And it will be again. It's not quite like present. But um, as I say, the opportunities. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, if it's done in a clever way. Yeah. And I think the signs are you know, you're not going to please everybody, and you know, everyone will grumble about bits and pieces. And, mm. Like um, the cathedral. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> I mean, it, it struck me right from the beginning that um, the cathedral was going to be a, a, a thorn, uh, or a point of contention anyway. And um, th the absolutely obvious thing to me, and it still seems to me remarkably obvious, but it's not going to happen, is to stabilise it exactly as it is and to leave it as the earthquake memorial. Because, A, it testifies to um, the power of the quake, which you rapidly forget, even though we've had 10,000 aftershocks, which have now diminished to almost nothing, thank God, because they were very tedious. You forget quite what that first thump was like. I mean, it was just like being picked up and shaken and thrown, you know. And what it did to... It is evident in the, the fallen spire of the cathedral and, and so on. It's, it also very neatly enshrines the sort of settler Christchurch with its Anglican mentality, you know, the 19th century ideal that was uh, we will build a, a house of God in stone in imitation of England, yeah. you know, called it Christchurch Cathedral, you know, Oxford, etc. And that was um, the mentality then, like at Olympic, that's how it was, and that was enshrined, especially in that building. Yeah. Now ruined. Also it, it was clearly the landmark of Christchurch. It was on the, you know, the, the, the logo of the Christchurch City Council, etc. It represented the former Christchurch. And it, was, it, it would act as a memorial for the people who died there, that, with a, a certain notion of the city that died at the same time, and out of which will come a new city, which will have many characteristics the same, but it will be definitely a new and different city. So leave that exactly as it is. I'd like to see, let Creeper grow over it. Yeah. Gradually. So it's an evolving thing. But it is, I would like to see it as the official earthquake memorial. We are not a God-fearing um, society in Christchurch anymore. I mean, how many people attended a service in a, an Anglican church last weekend? 10% of the population at most, I would say. You know, it, 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 it isn't us anymore. We're a secular society in New Zealand, by and large, despite the efforts of many. And a, a pluralistic, at least. Yeah. I, I just heard on the radio 160-odd languages were spoken in New Zealand now. Um, yeah, and I think that's great. I love it. It's an immigrant country. I love the variety of this. I mean, Christchurch itself has changed over... I've been there 25 years now. 
and it was pretty u central Christchurch and the suburbs were pretty uniformly blandly male and white yeah. you know yeah. the change that is if I, that's why I went to live in Littleton because it was a port and therefore cosmopolitan I'm used to living in with lots of different races around I like all I like the variety and the tolerance of it all well, Christchurch itself has become a lot of... I mean, you still can get shaven-headed racist thug. You'll always get a few of those, but you get them in. You've probably got them in Nelson, a few. But they do not represent the city. And um, they, we have become far more polyglot and, and far more welcoming and tolerant. And yeah. God, women get a far better deal than they did only 25 years ago in Christchurch. Yeah. You know, uh, it was run as an old boys club, really. Right. Uh, and now, far, far better, you know. Filipino communities and Korean communities and all the rest of it. And, and there, when people say, oh, God, you know, this Winston Peters Asian invasion, <laughs> bullshit, you know, it infuriates me. You know, what, what, sure, when, you know, let's say people immigrate from Laos here, you know, they're naturally going to move, mix with Laotians, don't know how to say it actually, uh, other people from Laos to start with because they've got a linguistic commonality. Yeah. They're kids. Yeah. Let's so say they came here in 1990. Their kids will be fluent Kiwis who also speak Laotian, La La the language of Laos. <laughs> what is it, Laotian? <laughs> you got well done, Chrissy. Good. Lousy. And, uh, yeah, yeah. and 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 their kids will be great Kiwis, but they'll also be different. They'll have that that influx of that, that element of uh, sure. the culture of Laos Absolutely. about it, but also they'll, they'll speak English as fluently as you and me. Yeah, yeah. And and they'll add to the richness of the bloody place. Sure. So. I, I'm all for it. Bring, yeah. bring people in. Let people come. Let's create a great, you know, Absolutely. melting pot culture, and which, which I think is happening, and, and it's quietly happening. No one's making a fuss about it. No. It's just quietly happening. I think it's great, and so Christchurch can reflect that. Yeah. Well, New Zealand is a country with with that's isolated. Basically, we, yep. we have no bordering countries. So, yep. therefore, I guess when we do have, when it was becoming the Asian invasion, it's because we we weren't it's just fear. Yeah. Just, just fear, fear just, of the other, fear of the other. We've been so unknown. isolated for so yeah. long. And, and it was the, the whole purpose of it, I mean, it was simply to get Winston Peters votes from the elderly. The elderly who remembered the Second World War, who had a vague suspicion of reds under the bed and, the, and the, the, you know, the Japs are coming, which was a legitimate fear in 1941. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, that, and that was played on by Winston Peters for one purpose only, which was to get votes to get him into Parliament. Mm. I mean, he even dipped his toe into the water the following election to see if he could, he could get a similar reaction about... Um, uh, uh, Islam. Oh. Do you remember that? Yes, and, and then he found that didn't work, so he backed off. Oh, God, he's a, he's a shit. I don't mind saying that. <laughs> I, I, loathe, I loathe the worm. So you won't be voting for his party? Oh, I, I, I haven't given him much thought. Yeah, um, <laughs> maybe. Who knows? On the day, the little pen may descend. You know. um, yeah. yeah. So how's, how do you feel Jerry Brownlee's handled Christchurch? Well, I think it's an almost impossible job to do. Yeah. Um, you are going to be loathed. You know, people resist change and, uh, and resent um, difficulties. And when you've got one person who has become the figurehead for that, whoever could have been Jesus, yeah. he would still be loathed, mocked, hated. You need pretty broad shoulders. You know, the amount of... Uh, uh, abuse that is that is virtually daily hurled at him via the columns or whatever to take all that and not to let it poison your mind is tough it's a hard hard job and there have been numerous little things that I would disagree with they're not uniquely his decision he's got a vast office of of you know intelligent people working none of whom have the intention of screwing anyone um, it may end up that some people get screwed inadvertently. There may be some injustices. I can think of some that have been perpetrated. But that's not the intention, and they're trying to do the best for the city. They, like everybody living in Christchurch, wants the best possible city to come out of it. Mm. And they are also constrained by things that, um, like money, um, that people don't give much thought to. Uh, it's very easy to criticise from the outside. Very difficult job. Um, I think the abuse he's received is largely ill-founded but it was always going to happen yeah. and uh, so no I've, I think by and large it's been handled well I mean EQC is a is a shambles of an organization and but only because it consisted of eight men and a dog before um, the earthquake because they had nothing to do and they had a kitty of money their job mainly was to invest that money into you know eat biscuits and and then suddenly they have to 
create, turn themselves into a giant insurance company with assessors and all the rest of it, at a time when the insurance companies are so busy they're recruiting anyone they can find to assess. So you end up with the dog going around assessing my house. Yeah. Um, so there's a, clearly a flaw in the system, and, and, and I can think so. There are shambles there that they've had to create huge systems that any large insurance company has already got in existence. Yeah. They've had to drum them up from nothing and uh, we, working with people who are in distress yeah. and who want an answer now because they've got no power, got no water, got no sewerage system or whatever. And uh, very, very tough. And they haven't done brilliantly, but it's entirely understandable. Their intentions are good. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I, I just got my my land assessment, my land damage assessment documents, because a bit of damage to my land, and uh, around the house. Um, I got that from my neighbour the other day because it was posted entirely to the wrong address <laughs> with the photographs of my house sent to a house up the road. Right. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's not unheard of, but, you know, it'll all resolve itself yeah. in due course. And, yeah. and it's hardly surprising. So, yeah. yeah. But, um, so. Yeah. It's brought the communities together. Oh, it's strange that. I mean, you know, a week after the earthquake, everyone was intimately involved with their neighbours and knew everyone because you shared the same water stand pipe and all the rest of it, and you'd help people out and, and yeah. all the rest of it. Now, oh, everyone's back to grunting again, you know, <laughs> exactly as you expect. You know. <laughs> so there, even though there was a slight temporary change, there's been yeah, no permanent change. Yeah, the status quo. You know, people will tell you others, but otherwise, you know, and, and sure, some people have made some friendships out of it, but, but by and large, you know, people live in their family units or on their own or whatever, yeah. and that's what you sort of shrink back to. And, yeah. Uh, but yeah, again, it was all part of the very interesting psychological um, experiment almost yeah. that the, the earthquake was. Joe Bennett, you're a fascinating speaker. Well, you're a fascinating interviewer, Chrissy. <laughs> Let's, shall we dive in the pool? <laughs> what a great After idea. After our pina colada. <laughs> Thank you very much for your highly entertaining morning. Oh, the, you've been a highlight. I, I thought and, that was uh, very dull, but thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Yeah, uh, and I hope your show goes, I'm sure it will I'll go look, extraordinarily well I look tonight. forward to seeing you at it. <laughs> Once you've read Double Happiness. <laughs> Better get on to speed reading. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.